بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمده واصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد ابي ريكورد كريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب so today i want to talk about khadija رضي الله عنها and maybe a little bit about Aisha radiallahu anha from the perspective of being a wife from the perspective of the qualities that she had as a wife <coughs> and the difference here becomes this that as you know in the islamic family system the husband has the role of being the amir he is in charge and so on and so forth but you find in his relationship sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet's relationship with khadija radiyallahu anha there's no sense of uh, someone being on top of the other oh second <coughs> so now i want to take you back to the events preceding the <coughs> nubuwa of the prophet and i want especially the sisters to start imagining themselves in the place of khatija as the following events are unfolding so here is a man muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he starts all of a sudden he starts you can say acting strange he starts going to the cave sometimes one day sometimes two days sometimes three days <clears throat> Now just imagine if you're the wife of this man who is beginning to go on the mountains what would be your reaction if your husband started to do this And then the people in the town start making whispers oh Muhammad you know he's going through some strange phase he goes to the mountains and then he comes back and the town people are also talking and the wife is hearing the town people talk what would you say to your husband then i would say that majority of in majority of the cases that there would have been a large argument between the husband and the wife already prior to even the coming of jibril alayhi salatu wasalam and then you further see <coughs> that when the Revelation finally comes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and just so that I can say it in in the context of its impact here comes someone shivering maybe even acting disoriented and crazy and he's saying zammiluni zammiluni cover me cover me and his wife covers him and he expresses the fact that i'm something very fearful has happened to me and his wife is com- giving him comfort and then not only that when he is doubting himself when he's doubting himself his wife says things to reinforce his confidence his security and saying things about him that give the qualities that he had that he was always truthful helping the poor people helping the people get their rights and so on and so forth and she is almost believing in him while he's thinking i've gone crazy this is why by the way in the quran in the early surahs it's specifically telling the prophet prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you haven't gone crazy don't think this is craziness nun wal qalami wa ma yasturun وَمَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ This is Surah Al-Qalam. So after Surah Al-Iqra, the second surah that was revealed after Iqra is Surah Al-Qalam, according to some of the scholars. Others say the second surah after Iqra is, is um, Mudassir. And then Surah Al-Qalam. And then Surah Al-Muzammil. So anyway, either Surah Al-Qalam was the third surah, Noon wal-Qalami wa ma yasturun. because that wa ma 'allama bil qalam 'allama al insana ma lam ya'lam that topic is now continuing this is twin surahs surah al qalam and surah al alaq are twin surahs they complement one another and in the same way surah al muzammil and surah al mudassir they complement one another so anyway <coughs> so here 
is a person who feels I'm going crazy. What is it that this is what what is this that I'm experiencing? And Khadija radiallahu anha is believing in him before he is believing in himself. He's doubting himself and Khadija is believing in him and having full faith in him. What type of personality is able to do that? What type of personality then after that? And you can take, you can, after this it even becomes more clear. As the Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُكُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَ خَيْرُكُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ The best of you people in Jahiliya are the best of you in Islam. Khatija was the best of the people in Jahiliya, so she was the best of the people in Islam. So just imagine, I would say, that in majority of the cases, majority of the wives, they would have been fighting their husbands, at least by the time that they would have heard the rumors within the city. And even when the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, a lot of people just dismissed him, saying, oh, this is just a phase in his life. He was going to the mountains and, you know, he had some, ure some eureka effect and, you know, he'll, be, he'll calm down in a few days, he'll be okay in a few days. So, anyway, so, now who is this Khadija? Is she, you know, some pious wife who is a homemaker? No. She is a businesswoman. She has a, what we can call in today's equivalence, a multinational corporation, okay? Because her business extends not only in Arabia, but is going to Syria and beyond. So she has a huge business. She would be one of those women that you would say that thinks that I don't need a man in my life. I don't need a man, I work for myself, I have a good life myself, I can support myself, I don't need a man. But yet, when she gets married, her attitude towards the Prophet ﷺ was very much like a what is typically and stereotypically understood to be the homemaker's attitude. Why? Why was Khadija, what qualities did she have? Not qualities from a fiqhi perspective, but qualities from the perspective of ihsan. What did, what did she have? What qualities did she have? And also, an interesting discussion here then also, because it's not just about women, it's, it's you know, Khadija saw something good in the Prophet too, that allowed her to be the way she was. But today I'm only concentrating on the wife, the attitude of the wife. So the qualities that the Prophet had, that Khatija radiallahu saw in him, those I'm not going to discuss today. I want to actually concentrate and zone in into the qualities of Khatija radiallahu anha. Something more about her life is that she had been married before the Prophet three times, sallallahu alayhi wa so this is a lady who has a very vast experience. She's been married before, she knows what family life is like, she has a business of her own, she's part of the nobility of Quraysh, right? She knows what life is like. Yet, <clears throat> she's able to submit herself to, just like actually the words of, I think, Sultan Nahl, when uh, Saba, the queen of Sheba, Surrendered to Suleiman. She surrendered using the words, Aslam tu ma'a Suleiman alillahi rabbil alameen. She's a queen, but she's saying, Aslam tu ma'a Suleiman. I surrender myself to Suleiman for what? Lillahi rabbil alameen. For Allah, who is the Lord of the worlds. So now, can this really happen? Can it happen today? I mean, I ask like the sisters, can it happen? Can you imagine? Can you visualize that there is a lady, she's a working woman, she's supporting her house, or she's, in, she's a CEO, CEO of her company, and yet she is still emotionally completely dependent, well, not completely, but she's emotionally very much dependent upon her husband. Can this happen? Is this possible? And then if it can happen, what are the qualities that this lady, Khadija radiallahu anha, that she has that allows her to, to do this, to be in this state. And so this is the question that I want to uh, focus on today.
So the number one quality that Khatija radiallahu anha still had, despite being a businesswoman, is she still had the sense and the importance and the value of understanding the importance of family life. Meaning, no matter what I'm doing in my business world, it's still not equal to the husband who gave me four daughters. It's still not equal to my family life because she understood that her happiness was not derived. She was not necessarily complete in life when she had her great business. She became complete in life after her marriage to the Prophet And so she realized and she understood that the Prophet completed her. Right? So this understanding of the word zawj, I mean this exact word in the Arabic language, and you know, in Arabic language, as I've mentioned many times, the Quran doesn't use any synonymous terms. And there are two words for wife in the Arabic language. And the one word in the Arabic, Arabic language for wife is imra. Imra'atul fir'aun. Imra is just simply a wife who doesn't have that bond with her husband. She doesn't see herself as a pair of her husband. In fact, uh, so you have for the wife of Abu Lahab, is used. Okay? And the word zawj is used when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show the complementary nature of things. And this was a major part of the Arab mentality because even in the Arabic language, dual, you know, we have singular, dual, and plural. Why did they have dual in Arabic language? Why, why? No other language in the world has a dual. You have something for one, you have something for plural. One and more than one. But why does the Arabic language in the, in the, in the, in the, in the in, not in the first person, in first person has only I and we, ana wa nah. But in the, in the second person and the third person, there's a dual. Why? Because the Arabs had the mentality of understanding the complement. This is before Islam. This is why part of understanding Qur'an is to understand the Arabic language. Part of understanding the Arabic language is to understand the culture that they came from. And in many shari aspects, many shari hukums can be derived because of, through understanding the Arab culture itself. So the duality of things in nature, the complementary aspects of things in nature, like in China they call it the yin yang. The yin yang nature. Things complement day and night. You find this in the Qur'an, this complementary nature of things mentioned in the Qur'an over and over again too. So what was it that Khadija radiallahu anha, as a female living in the Arab culture, what, and, and being a working, working woman, what did she see? She saw the values of being a homemaker. She saw that her happiness doesn't come from uh, just being rich and partying. But her happiness came by finding a right partner and marrying that right partner and making a life with that right partner. And so even if women are working, they must realize that the number one quality of the righteous women, you know, a good wife, even if she's working and she's helping the household, is that she feels that her value system her values, what brings her happiness, is not her job. And in fact, most women look at jobs as jobs. They don't see jobs as a place of, uh, of where they derive uh, personal happiness. And in fact, in America itself, and this is very interesting because there are two interesting phenomena happening in America. One is, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, when the feminist movement was making all these claims that women are equal to men, and all of these claims were being made, just as this was happening, because I mean the feminist movement actually starts in England, then comes to America, the feminist movement has been through three different phases in America. I mean, this is a separate topic. But when, in the 80s, what started to happen is, as the feminist movement is on the rise, and it became politically incorrect to say, oh, women should stay at home, it became politically incorrect to, uh, to think of women as different from men, but you had to think of them as equally to men. 
just as this was happening, research work started to come into the, into the scene more and more and more, showing the differences between men and women. I mean, there are so many things, I mean, at the hormonal level, at how our brains are different, how our anatomy, our, our physiology is, is, is different, and just more and more, even to the point that, uh, I don't know how many people heard about, like, I think four, three, four years ago, even the, the president of Harvard University made some statements about how women are different from men in mathematics and in science and in different subjects and it became like a big uh, politically incorrect thing to say and there was a big hoopla about this. The point I'm trying, and you know the, the, the research work, I forget the name of the author, but she's done or he's done a very awesome work, it's called The Female Brain. Another work that has been done on this is the forgetful female, meaning because of their hormones and so on and so forth, how it affects them. And you know, the ayah of the Qur'an where it says if one woman forgets, then let the other remind. There, there's so much research work now that even they're behind. Because the, the psychological effects of women's hormones on their memory and on their emotions, this is still not taken into account in eyewitnessing in the American courts, which it should be. Because when you're talking about eyewitnessing, you, are need, you need to know how reliable is the eyewitness. So anyway, there are other reasons too, I'm not going to go into that. But the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, that Khadija radiallahu anha, she simply understood that her happiness will come from making the house. And that her job was something that she just happened to do. It just, in certain circumstances, she started this. And she was from a big family and a noble family. She had the opportunity and she did it. But she understood that her, and this is why when she saw the Prophet, she saw certain qualities in him, which we can talk about one day. And she was able, she proposed to him. She didn't waste any time. Because she felt, being an Arab lady, that she's not complete with that yin yang. She's not complete without a husband. And she also understood, because she was married before, and she, and she, you know, she, and jahid, this was a place of jahiliyyah. You know, she knew the, the, she had all the options a woman would have today, in terms of going to being a, a dancer in a strip club, to being a homemaker. All those options were available in the Arabia at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu All of those options were available. But Khadija had a quality where she then gave the Prophet ﷺ four daughters. And this is where her happiness came from. So my advice to sisters is that, yeah, you, you're, you, you, you are independent if you're working. You could maybe pay the rent, but that's not, or you could buy things, or maybe you make more money than your husband, as was in the case of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? If she wanted, Khatija radiallahu anha could look down on the Prophet He doesn't make the same as me. But she understood that her happiness came from being one with him. At the level of ihsan. And by understanding that this harmony can be, her happiness comes from being in harmony with her husband. This is what completes her at the psychological level, at the physiological level. At, in all levels, this is what uh, completes her as a human being and that this is another thing is that sometimes we work on our you know we all have identities like for example I have many identities I'm a resident scholar at Furqan Foundation I'm the uh, in charge of Darul Qada at the MCC MEC community I have many identities but the first my first primary identity is I'm a human being then my next identity more than that is I'm a Muslim Right? Then my next identity is I'm from here and I do this and I do this. Today, nowadays, people, you ask them, so who are, who are you? Oh, I'm an accountant. Right? Well, who are you? You're, what you do becomes your identity. And we want our women to be proud of themselves. And we want our women to go into careers. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But where do you identify your identity? It, the lower you, the more fundamental your hap, your the more fundamental you're okay with yourself at the more fundamental level is the happier you will be. The more you go up the ladder, like for example, if I am doing great, 
as a resident scholar of Quran Foundation. This will bring me some happiness. It'll give me some title, some identity, some, some sense of accomplishment, some sense of I've done something with my life. I'm sitting somewhere and I have a respectable position. But, my, but if I'm not okay with being Muslim, for example, right? the more basic identity, I'm not okay with being a man. I'm not okay with being who I, well, Allah created me as a man, as a human being. If I'm not okay with that, then all of the upper identities, which are human man-made identities, versus the God-made identities. So if our sisters are not okay with being female, but they're okay with, I want to become a career woman, right? I'm okay with being a career woman, I'm okay in pursuing the careers of the world, and I'll be a big lawyer, and I'll be out there, and I'm gonna, shh, uh, you know, but if you're not okay with yourself, لَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنثَى if you're not okay with who Allah made you as a female, it, Khadija was, she was happy with who Allah made her. She, and being, knowing that who you are meant you knew where your basic happiness will come from. She understood I have millions of dollars, but my happiness will come from being happy with Muhammad Making a home with Prophet Muhammad and so here it is, is that if you're, this is the problem with the sisters today and this feminazi, you know, movement that has basically made women uncomfortable with their biology, their, 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 their physiological self. They want to deny that aspect, that as if they're not women. And, but they want to make them happy with the titles that they make of the world. And you will never get happiness like this. You talk to any feminist lady who has been part of the feminist movement, they're always upset and angry. I'm, I'm not joking. I mean, I have studied the feminist movement in some detail. I've studied it in some detail enough to know that, that there is a lot of anger and a lot of unhappiness. And it happens from when you don't accept your biology, your ana anatomy, your physiology. And you don't accept yourself being a female. When you're not going to be happy as a female, then you're not going to be happy as a wife. Because it's in your biology that you will see parts, a lot of the aspects of your happiness will come from your biological being. If you're, if you're going to deny the fact I'm female, right? But I'm this career... This, Khatija didn't do this. This is why, as great of a businesswoman she was, she was also a great homemaker. Because she knew my happiness comes from being with being a homemaker, being a wife to Muhammad. And the other thing that comes here is this. And so this is very important because I want this to be clear to our sisters. We have identities as human beings. In philosophy, we call this subject anatological studies. Anatology is the study of the self. If I am not happy with my Islam, if I'm not happy with Islam, for example, then I'll never be happy with the, with the rules Islam gives. I'm never going to be happy with the rules Islam gives. If I'm not happy with being a male, then I'm not going to be happy in any of the role, roles of, the, of playing the male. You see, and so in the same way, if you are number one, so our sisters have a dual problem. Our men have a single problem. The problem of the men is they're not happy with Islam. It, they may say they are, but the reality is we are not. Man yashrah sadrahu lil Islam. This is something that's, that has to happen. Our sisters are unhappy with Islam, and they're also unhappy with the fact that God created them females. It's a double, double problem. And then on top of that, add all the, the media and the stereotypes and all of that. It becomes, it, they feel like, and so what has this world done? It's put men against women. It's pitched men against women, where they can't work together. Whereas the Islamic worldview is the world of duality. Where men see themselves needing the women, and the women see themselves that for our happiness we also need the men. But the, dual, the world of feminism says women can be happy without men. And men can be happy without women. 
And so when you have this type of mentality, how are people going to get along? And so I was saying that research work started to come out. That in the 70s and the 80s where it became so profoundly true that men are so different from women. The science is there, and this is always the case, uh, something that I have to explain, uh, which is that science is, society is always behind science. Science, society is always behind research. For example, in physics, the amount of information we have about the universe in physics is not even taught, even in the universities right now, because new things are being found every day. They hardly teach Einstein's theory still. They hardly teach Einstein properly. They only teach Newton, who was... We still, even in America, our curriculum is still essentially, in America, our curriculum, our state curriculum, is still essentially 100 years old. It's still essentially 100 years old. And the updated knowledge makes a lot of things very clear. How men and women are different. Why women need men. Why husband, and what, how we communicate different. All so much work has been done in so many of these different fields of gender studies. And so my point is, is that all this research work started to come out, even now in the medical field. You know what they do now? They have vitamins just for women. Right? This is for vitamins for women. These are the, the nutrients the women need. Why? It's, it is just a way of getting money more. Just another technique to get money. That's part of it. But there's also something essentially true about it. That is that women and men have also different biological needs. They have, their body needs to do different things. And so, this is the first. The second is, what's the number one reason for divorce in America? What's the number one reason? Statistically, this is well known. What's the number one reason? It's finances. Money. So what does that tell you? People are arguing over money. People are arguing over success. People are arguing over who owns what. That means that they're not working on their primary, they're not happy at their primary identities. They're fighting over their secondary, third, fourth, tertiary, and so identities. They're, they're lost in those identities. Your root, if, you're, if your root is not good, the tree will not be good. If you're not happy with yourself being a female, which is the case, I would say, for even in the Muslim world, especially in the Muslim world, where women are not happy, just simply not happy being, not willing to accept themselves as women. It's like, you know, when the black man tries to act like the white man, but it never happens. Or when the Desi man tries to act like the black man, never happens. You can't run away from your skin. You know, you can't, you, you, and, and you just end up just hurting yourself. And so you have a bunch of Muslim women that think about their careers, how they're going to be so awesome, but in the same time denying the basic psychological, fundamental, biological needs that they need to be happy. And what does Islam do? Even when Allah, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when the husband calls the wife and she should come, it's all about what? Serving the basic needs. The more basic needs. And so, women need to learn in Islam. Was Maryam happy being a female? Was Khadija happy being a female? So, even if a wife is working day and night and she has so much power and so much resources and so much effect but if if she's not happy with being a female she will not be happy and if she's not happy being a female she may be very successful in the eyes of the world but she's not only going to be not happy she's also going to be having a terrible marriage and then but that lady, and this is why, this is, you know, the scholars have talked about this. The idea of kufwa in marriage. And that is that, what is kufwa? Kufwa is having equal, right? Like if there's a man, scholars, Hanafi scholars have talked about this. Which is that if there is a man, he's poor. He should be careful if he's going to marry a wife that is very rich. 
There should be kufwa. You should be from the same cultural context so that she will feel some emotional dependency upon you. Otherwise, she will be at a different level. And so, what happens uh, in the same way they've talked about even cultures, the Arab culture marrying the Indians of Ghana, the scholars have talked about this. There should be kufwa, there should be some sense of the male has something more that the female will be dependent upon him. But we don't live in that world necessarily anymore. It's a very different world. And so what? So now, we, and more than that, not only do we not live in, in that type of world, but now we're living in a world where women are simply not willing to accept that Allah has created them as women. And so this becomes a big source of conflict. Now, what else? So, so here's an event that I'm sure you all have heard, but it's to further emphasize what I was saying. And that is, the Prophet Sallallahu he is married to Khatija radiallahu anha. And Khatija uh, radiallahu and you know she brings all her wealth, and and she tells the Prophet just wait here, and and then she invites all the leaders of Quraysh, and she says bear witness I've given on my this is before Nabuwa she says bear witness I've given on my, all my wealth to Muhammad why because she knew where her happiness comes from, and so it is important for us to distinguish success with happiness. A lot of people that are CEOs, they're very successful, but they're not happy. And you have to sometimes make a choice. If you want to be a career female, I mean, Islam doesn't stop you. Especially, I, don't, I say this in this context. Do I want sisters out there working about? I don't. But I understand the reality of the situation is that number one, there are more sisters than their brothers. Number two, marriage material brothers are even less than marriage material sisters. This is just the reality that's on the ground. And then the reality is that uh, some, some of the families, they're going to have to have their, uh, their wives are going to have to help out and so on and so forth. So this is just the reality of it. This is why I'm saying Islam doesn't stop. But if there was an actual choice, then I think the choice for a wife, for a mother, should be to, 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 to invest in the house, invest in the kids. Invest time there. And this is seen in the modern world as, you know, it's it, one thing about the modern world that we live in today, not so much anymore. Things are changing in terms of influences in the world right now. But in the last 30, 40 years, whether it was religion, whether it was family life, whether it was law, everything was looked at from an economic perspective. Everything was looked at through the lenses of economics. And if you ever want to know in which field are the most atheists within the social sciences, not physical sciences. In the physical sciences, the most atheists are in physics, are in, in the field of physics. In the social sciences, where it's dealing with, and this is a general statement, I mean things like this change around, but in, in the social sciences where it deals with sociology, psychology, economics, and so on and so forth, they're all largely atheists. They're all, like this, these are the fields. And still, you can have a, people who believe God, they're biologists or they're doctors and engineers, and you can still, but in these fields, psychology, sociology, philosophy, anthropology, law, so on and so forth, and ec economists, these are all in, very heavily influenced by atheists' thoughts, and fem feminism is part of this, all of this. And of these, the most atheistic, the most materialistic, the most, you can say, only to empirical rationalism is economists. That's why you will find very few economists who are religious, even in the Muslim world. And even the economists that are religious, they're religious in a very materialistic sense. This is a side point. But the point I'm trying to make is simply that they saw the world for 30 years from an economic point of view. So if wife is at home, husband is working, that's a loss. Wife should be working. That's not helping the family, that's causing damage to the family. And that is looking at the world in a different view from how Islam sees things as complementing one another. 
why the psychology of the male to go out and work and bring something on the table is something that needs to be studied and I will inshallah talk about this. But the male's ability, a male has a psychological need, more basic need. Meaning in other words, when a female is working and bringing food on the table, right? It can be a need. Like for example, she's a single mother and she's a child. She has to support the child. She has to go out and work. I'm not talking about this scenario. I'm talking about the scenario where she's a female. She's also a career woman. She puts food on the table. She is satisfying her third level identity, right? But when the male goes out and puts food on the table, he's satisfying which level of his identity? His basic, his first level of identity. I mean, even if you are an atheist and you believe in ideas of Darwin, just the hunters and gatherers, right? The hunters, who are the hunters? Women stayed in the caves with the children and the men, they had to go out and hunt the food and bring the food and so on and so forth. So this is the male psychology from the dawn of time as far as homo sapiens are concerned. Males have a greater psychological need to what? To provide for the family. It's a more basic sense of identity for them. And Islam, in Islam, Allah puts everything in a balance. Right? Just as Khadija radiallahu anha, she was a working woman, but she understood her basic, her basic thing. She understood, I'm a female. I want to be a wife. I want to be, and I'll find happiness in being a wife. When you find, when you look for happiness in our human man-made created identities, they don't bring happiness. They may bring success, they don't bring happiness. In the God-given aspects of ourselves, that's where you find what? That's where you find happiness. So, so the first quality Khatija radiallahu anha had was that she was very content and very okay with her being a female. And that meant she was very content with her being a wife, which then meant she was very content with being a good wife. She wanted to prove and show that I'm a good wife and be a good wife. And she was a good wife. And so, this is one thing that I wish sisters would understand. I hope I've been able to lay it out in a very logical way for them to understand this. The second quality that Khatija radiallahu anha she had was that she, within the context of, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? Okay. Within the context of the world that she was living in, even though she was a businesswoman and she was working uh, this business and she saw the good qualities in the Prophet ﷺ and the good qualities that were in him, but what else did she have? Besides the fact she was okay with who she was and she understood her happiness will come from being at home, but what uh, the other quality that she had was that she, look at what she says to the Prophet Sallallahu when the Prophet comes to her and says, I think I'm going crazy Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was feeling this, I'm not saying this, he was feeling this. And, uh, and so Khatija says what to him? You honor the orphans. You make salah bayn nas You know, you, you are good to your relatives. What does this tell you about our mentality? What does it tell you about our value system? You know, uh, Dr. Isra Ahmed, uh, in his Tanzim there was a meeting. And so one of the men who was married to one of his daughters, my dad, I think it was my dad or one of my dad's friends, asked him, you know, how is it, uh, some discussion happened, you know, Dr. Sub's a daughter, you're married to her, how, you know, how does it, how does it work? And he's like, he said, she's always pushing me to do the work of the deen. She's always what? Pushing me to do the work of the deen. She found happiness in her husband going and participating and, and doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to do. She found happiness in this, right? And so here it is, Khatija, it's the same thing when Khatija radiallahu anha is saying, you know, you have all these great qualities. What type of a female was she? Yeah, she was a great businesswoman, 
But what is she seeing in the Prophet? What is she admiring in him? Right? What she's admiring in the Prophet, like the Prophet says, Al Mu'min al Mira' al Mu'min, and Mu'min is a, is a reflection of another believer. You can see the reflection of Khadija. What is it that she's admiring? Right? What are the qualities? And this is very, very important actually for the men and the women to understand this point that I'm about to mention because this is a fundamental psychological difference between males and females. I'll tell it to you in the form of a joke. The joke is that a husband and wife got married. And so then after the wedding they asked the husband, so you've been married for some time, who's the boss? Who's the boss? So he said, of course I am. So he said, how do you know you're the boss? He says, well, I decide if we're Republican or Democrat. I decide what? If we're Republican or Democrat. That was the criteria. The point here is that she's in charge of everything else, but he decides which party the... Huh? He decides which party the... the meaning what? What's the difference? Why women need men? And why men need women? is a very fundamental question from this perspective because do women yet yeah, do women need men men only to reproduce women can also work they can also run societies they can be governors and they can be kings and, and they can be queens and they can do everything why do they need men this is a basic question in the in the field of anthropology why why do women need men meaning throughout history we find women need what men until the feminist movement came and then most of those real feminist poor women, they never got married and they were never happy. You can just read their lives and see how many of them did suicide and all of that. And even till today, average American females, they feel they need men. So what is going on? What is this? There is a female's need to want a man. And the male also needs the female at the psychological level. But at the grander level, what role, what makes the male what role does the male play that the female does not play as much? And that is that the male, besides reproducing for the female, helping her reproduce, right? The female can do all the things the male can, but the one thing that sets the male apart from the female is the male is obsessively interested in the outside world. Obsessively interested in the outside world as in managing the affairs of the world, the politics of the world, the direction of civilization, the long, you know, the, the uh, creating a civilization from that perspective. Men are obsessed with this. And, and you know, uh, I'll give you uh, one example. Uh, there are many examples, but one example that I'll give you is that there was a, a journalist who went to India. And so he's observing India. And he comes back and he writes, you know, everyone in India talks about politics. Tea and politics. This is what his article was about, tea and politics. Men, they like to talk. Even if you look at the talk radio shows, yeah, women are gung-ho about, you know, certain one or two issues of abortion or, or you know, uh, if this person's right or if we should go or Muslims are bad or whatever it is. They're, but really, men are obsessed with making societies work. And so, uh, this obsession that men have, again, goes back to their fundamental identity. It goes back to their anthropological, historical, fundamental uh, identity. Whereas women do what? Women create culture. They create food. Right? Food is culture. They teach the baby language. What's language? Culture. Right? They, uh, they teach them the manners. What's that? Manners, manners is culture. Women, are, women create culture and mannerisms. Mannerisms are under culture. Women create culture. Women, men create structures. Men create structures. And because this is what men naturally do, so they have been given a position within a structure. Because it, it helps to satisfy a basic identity of theirs. Anyway, so why am I saying this? Now come back to what 
Khadija is saying all these things about the Prophet. You do this and you do this and you do this and you do this, you do this. What were all these things she was talking about? All the things the Prophet was doing outside the, outside the house. But it made her proud that the Prophet was doing these things outside the house. That he was doing good things outside the house. And so besides the fact that she would find what happiness through her marriage with the Prophet in this system of yin yang, but also she found that she wanted to be that wife who pushes her husband to what? Who encourages her husband, right? Because she is so confident about him doing these good things that it could have not just been an individual wanting to do those things. It had to be the duality wanting to do these things together. And so here it is, Khadija radiallahu anha, she's interested, she's expressing the good things the Prophet has done. And so when you're interested instead of success on values, instead of what we understand to be success, you're interested in what? The values you bring to the world, the values you, your husband brings to the world. Are you more interested that your husband's making an X amount of money? Or are you more interested in how many, let's say, shahadas your husband gave? Or how many uh, people he helped that were in difficulty? That, that should make a wife proud of her husband. Those are the qualities that should make a wife proud of her husband. That my, my husband is a useful person. He's good to me. And that not only is he good to me, but he's useful. This word useful is what I want to underline. Because women need to see useful men. Not necessarily successful. But they, they, what they do matters. What they do counts. It's useful in some way. And Khadija finds her identity then... Her, her, the Prophet's ability to express her values then becomes part of her own, becomes part of her own value system. And so she understood that the Prophet's doing this, but a lot of it was the opportunities. This is why she said, because the Prophet saw poor people and she said, okay, all this wealth is yours, you do with it. Because she is able to express her values through the Prophet's son lives. And it's done in harmony in that way. So I will end here. Aqul qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimat. As-salamu alaykum.